Thank you for joining us for CBN Newswatch. I'm Ephraim Graham. Ahead today, Israel capturing or killing 170 Hamas fighters as they use the Shifa hospital complex in Gaza for a terrorist base. The warfare coming as the Biden administration keeps up its pressure on the government of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu not to launch a major assault on the last Hamas stronghold in the city of Rafah. A huge terrorist attack in Moscow, killing 137 people as ISIS claims responsibility. And American leaders warn it could happen here in the United States. The Supreme Court set to take up what's being called the most important, important abortion case since Roe versus Wade was overturned. The case dealing with the availability of the abortion pill. And they were hidden heroes during World War II for their secret missions. Now, members of the group known as the Ghost Army have gotten some very public recognition for their accomplishment. All those stories and more ahead today, right here on CBN News Watch. This is CBN News Watch. And we begin this half hour in Israel, where Israeli forces are keeping up their attacks on Hamas fighters as the fighting continues at the Shifa hospital. And amid the ongoing warfare, the Biden administration is pressuring the government of Benjamin Netanyahu not to launch a major military operation into Rafah. Chris Mizzer reports now from Jerusalem. The face-off puts the Biden administration and the Netanyahu government on a collision course. In Gaza, the IDF announced after six days of fighting, it's eliminated 170 Hamas terrorists who use the Al-Shifa hospital as a terror base. This operation isn't over yet. Right now, Hamas and Islamic Jihad terrorists are barricading themselves inside the Shifa hospital wards. Hamas is destroying the Shifa hospital. Israel's defense minister is heading to Washington to meet Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and other officials to discuss the war in Gaza and to ensure the flow of weapons and materials necessary for Israel's air defense systems. Also this week, a delegation of Israeli government officials visiting Washington will discuss plans to invade Rafah, the last Hamas stronghold in Gaza. The U.S. opposes the operation and wants to explore alternatives. Sunday, Vice President Kamala Harris wouldn't rule out consequences if Israel launches its operation into Rafah to defeat Hamas. We have been clear in multiple conversations and in every way that any major military operation in Rafah would be a huge mistake. Those consequences could include placing conditions on future U.S. military aid. On Friday, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu told Secretary of State Israel's decision. I also said that we have no way to defeat Hamas without going into Rafah and eliminating the rest of the battalions there. And I told him that I hope we will do it with the support of the USA, but if we have to, we'll do it alone. In the north, the IDF hit Hezbollah sites after Hezbollah fired at least 50 rockets into Israel. Today, Israelis here in Jerusalem are celebrating the biblical feast of Purim, celebrating when Queen Esther defeated a Persian plot to exterminate the Jews. It's especially meaningful this year when Jews again feel they're fighting for their survival after October 7th. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu marked the holiday with IDF soldiers. As in ancient times, like our brothers, we're also united. We're fighting and we will be victorious, and we will enter Rafa and achieve total victory. We eliminated Haman, and we will also eliminate Sinwar. Happy holiday to you. In Jerusalem, Christians from around the world celebrated Palm Sunday, the day Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey and was hailed by crowds as their Messiah. Even during this time of war, Christians flocked to the holy city, both to worship God and support Israel. I know there's a lot going on here in the Holy Land, and I'm here to pray for the Jews. I'm here to pray for everyone. It's my love of Jesus Christ why I'm here. Chris Mitchell joins us now from Jerusalem. So, Chris, why is the Israeli assault on Hamas terrorists at the Al-Shifa hospital uh, so significant? Well, Effie, you probably remember back in November, that was the focus, the epicenter of one of the uh, major times when they actually went into a major hospital there in Gaza. Uh, right now, since then, uh, Hamas has hijacked the, the hospital. And right now, as the IDF is charging, that they're hiding behind the sick and injured and waging war from inside. And uh, Israeli special forces have been conducting, as what they say, precise activities in Al-Shifa 
to be able to prevent harm to civilians, the patients and the medical teams there. And uh, so far, not only 170 have been killed, but about 500 terrorists affiliated with Hamas and Islamic Jihad have been apprehended by uh, special forces. So it's been going on six days. In the meantime, they've found a large uh, amount of weapons uh, hidden among the medical equipment and the patients and the uh, civilians. They've also taken great pains to be able to get civilians out of harm's way. So. Uh, other than Rafa right now, I think this is the main battle going on inside the Gaza Strip between Hamas and the IDF. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu told Secretary of State Antony Blinken Israel will go into Rafa with or without the United States' help. And Vice President Kamala Harris, as we saw in your report, warned there could be consequences for such an invasion. How are these messages being received there in Israel? Well, publicly, you know, we have two sides right now. You know, Benjamin Netanyahu is saying uh, they're going into Rafah whether the U U U.S. wants them or not or whether the U.S. will help them or not. Uh, it's really a moment of truth because Israel sees this as really a significant moment uh, right now because unless they go into Rafah uh, and defeat those four battalions that are still remaining in there and hiding themselves among the maybe two million, two million Gazans there, uh, they don't believe the war would be won. They believe actually the war is going to be lost. So this is really a crisis in U.S.-Israel relations, and uh, we'll just see what happens. Uh, in that report, we do know that uh, perhaps Ron Dermer, who is the uh, Minister of Strategic Affairs, Zakhbet Hanegbi, he's the National Security Advisor. They plan to be in Washington, and they're going to be talking about whether or not there are alternatives that the U.S. would be amenable to if uh, Israel or when Israel goes into Rafah. Now, we understand Israel has banned aid from UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, from going into northern Gaza. Why is Israel taking this action uh, when there is talk of a humanitarian crisis there? Well, there's two narratives going on right now uh, between uh, Israel and uh, the United Nations. Uh, <clears throat> COGET, which is the, uh, the Israeli organization that allows and, and sends aid into there, uh, they saying they're sending as much aid as the UN can, uh, can handle. And their claim is that the United Nations is really not able to distribute the aid, and they don't want to work with UNRWA. Uh, because they believe UNRWA is uh, infiltrated with Hamas uh, operatives. So, and the, on the other hand, the UN is saying that uh, there's not enough aid coming in. Uh, the Secretary General of the UN was there yesterday, and he implied that it was really Israel not sending uh, enough uh, enough aid. To, it's exactly that's. Just the opposite story that we're hearing from Israel right now, but they're sending as much aid as they can. They're inspecting the aid, and uh, it's really a matter of distribution inside the Gaza Strip uh, once it gets in there. Once Israel puts it in there, they lose control of much of it, and uh, they're really not, they don't trust, uh, especially UNRWA, once it gets to that UN organization. Let's talk conflict on another front. You reported Israel struck back at Hezbollah after it launched still more attacks into the Jewish state. Is Israel prepared now to take on Hezbollah after the war with Hamas is over? Yes, I believe it is. And uh, as some people up north and uh, wherever you may talk to here, actually in, uh, in Jerusalem as well, uh, some people think it's really inevitable. Uh, Hezbollah, in, in terms of what's happening in Israel, has about 80,000 people held hostage. And what I mean by that is that uh, all those people either had to voluntarily or, or they had to mandate people to leave the, uh, the, the northern border, uh, and they're not back there where they used to live and had their works and their livelihoods, many of them scattered throughout the country, some of them here in Jerusalem. Uh, so many people believe that's an intolerable intoler situation, and, uh, and they say even if Hezbollah just continues this slow-scale conflict, uh, Israel has to go in there to take back this, uh, t this threat m far greater than Hamas from Israel's northern border. Israel is celebrating the biblical holiday of Purim today. Why is it so special this year? Well, Ephraim, uh, just a couple of blocks away from here, we saw the Purim Parade. Uh, it was actually a little bit controversial because some people thought it wasn't the right time to be celebrating with all the hostages still uh, held captive inside Gaza. So what they did is they actually had families, family members of hostages uh, lead the parade. And so they wanted to be able to keep the tradition alive, keep the celebration alive. Uh, and why is it so important this year? It's the same story as it was about 3,000 years ago. 
Back then, Haman wanted to eliminate the Jews, and, uh, and then we've seen almost in every generation, it seems like someone rises up like a Haman, like a Hitler, and now like a Hamas to eliminate the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. They all had the same goal. They wanted to kill the Jews. And yet, at that time, God had a deliverer. Her name was Esther, chosen for the kingdom for such a time as this. And that's why it's so important to be celebrating that. Many people are saying October 7th is never again now, and they want to commemorate that here on Purim. All right. Thank you so much, Chris Mitchell, reporting from Jerusalem. As always, we appreciate your insights. Stay safe and know that we back here are praying for you and our team with you there in Israel. Coming up, the investigation into the deadly terrorist attack in Russia that left at least 137 people dead and far more wounded. The ISIS affiliate in Afghanistan is claiming responsibility. Some U.S. leaders are warning a similar massacre could happen here at home or against Americans overseas. We're going to bring you a look at that story when we come back. Stay with us. Russia is continuing to question who was really behind the deadly attack at a concert hall in Moscow Friday. It killed at least 137 people and injured more than 180. ISIS has claimed responsibility, but Russian President Vladimir Putin is blaming Ukraine. But U.S. leaders are worried a similar strike could happen here in America. I want to warn you, some people may find some images in this video disturbing. CBN still heard is on the story. Four men accused of staging the Russian concert hall attack that killed more than 130 people appeared before a Moscow court showing signs of severe beatings. All four were charged with terrorism. One appeared to be barely conscious during Sunday's hearing. All of the men are from the Central Asian Republic of Tajikistan, which borders Afghanistan. The massacre happened in an auditorium on the outskirts of Moscow as a crowd gathered for a sold-out rock concert. People in their seats heard what sounded like fireworks. At least four men with automatic weapons had begun firing repeatedly into the crowd. Then they set the concert hall on fire. ISIS-K, the terror group's affiliate in Afghanistan, was quick to claim responsibility for the attack. The same group is responsible for the killing of 13 U.S. service members during the pullout from Afghanistan. Russian President Vladimir Putin claims the men were headed to Ukraine, where persons there were preparing to let them cross the border. But Vice President Kamala Harris said that's not true. There is no whatsoever any evidence, and in fact what we know to be the case is that ISIS-K is actually, um, by all accounts, responsible for what happened. What has U.S. leaders very concerned is the possibility that a similar terrorist massacre could happen here in the U.S. or against Americans overseas. And they'll do it here in the homeland. And we're very, I think we should be very concerned, as the FBI director confirmed to me, that there is a wing, there is a trafficking network out there that specializes in moving people. They do it for profit moving people and migrants around the world, including across our southern border, who have links to ISIS. The head of U.S. Border Patrol, Jason Owens, was asked if he's concerned. Absolutely. That's, uh, that, you, you ask any law enforcement officer, especially somebody that works in border security, that is what keeps us up at night. And if we don't know who is coming into our country and we don't know what their intent is, that is a threat. And they're exploiting a vulnerability that's on our border right now. Former FBI Special Agent Eric Karen told CBN News he's especially concerned about America's ports, where Customs and Border Protection physically inspect only 3 percent of incoming containers. We have 328 ports of entry into America. They all have to be secure, and many of them are soft. Karen says last year there were over 1,000 joint terrorism task force cases related to sleeper cells and terrorist threats in the U.S. There's also concern for the millions of Americans who live or travel abroad throughout Europe and Asia. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Still ahead, it is being called the most important case involving abortion at the United States Supreme Court since the end of Roe v. Wade. It deals with the availability of the so-called abortion pill, and it goes before the justices tomorrow. We're going to have that story for you right after this.
The Supreme Court is set to hear arguments Tuesday in what's being called the most important abortion case since the justices overturned Roe v. Wade last year. The court will ultimately decide whether to make the so-called abortion pill less available. CBN medical reporter Lori Johnson brings us a look at what's at stake. As a college freshman, Rebecca Hagen learned she had an unwanted pregnancy. There was the absence of hope. I felt desperate. Like many women who choose abortion, Rebecca took mifeprestone, also called mifeprex. Immediately, regret set in. Oh my word, you know, can I take back this decision? Can I save this baby? Rebecca became an exception as she was able to reverse the pill's effects and go on to deliver a healthy baby. With most women who take it, however, the baby dies. What's more, the mother often suffers complications, which can include sepsis or even death. The further in pregnancy she is, the more common it is that she's going to have to have surgery, sometimes emergency surgery for hemorrhage, for, you know, a, a massive amount of bleeding or for tissue left inside. Back in 2000, the Food and Drug Administration approved mifepristone to be taken up to seven weeks into pregnancy and that women be given the pill at one of three required in-person doctor visits. Beginning in 2016, the FDA began removing those safeguards. One change makes the pills much easier to get because in-person visits are no longer required. Another change, the gestation limit was raised to 10 weeks pregnant. It currently allows uh, abortion drugs to be mailed to women uh, in their dorm rooms uh, without ever seeing in person a health care provider. That, that's reckless um, and FDA should fix that. Tuesday, Regent Law Professor Aaron Hawley will ask the U.S. Supreme Court to order the original safeguards be put back in place. Recently, she practiced answering questions from other Regent Law professors acting as justices. FDA's own current label for the drug notes that between 2.9 and 4.6 percent of women, that's roughly 1 in 25, will go to the emergency room. And that was before they stripped away the in-person visit. Holly says FDA research conducted after removing the safeguards shows they made a dangerous drug even more so and admits to relying on emergency physicians to treat complications. One of the studies they discussed said as many as one in eight women will need unplanned medical care after taking these drugs. Holly represents a group of pro-life doctors who claim when the FDA relaxed mifepristone's prescribing guidelines, it made women less safe. And we know that the incidence of complications from uh, chemical abortion, from these abortion drugs, are increasing. While that creates more suffering for patients, it also weighs on pro-life doctors by putting them in the position of becoming complicit in an abortion. And if a woman comes in who's bleeding, and, her, and she's bleeding enough that it threatens her life, and her baby still has a heartbeat, we're going to take the baby because that's going to affect, it. we could lose both of them. So what that does is it forces us to be a partner in the abortion process, in the elective abortion process. Harrison adds the doctor's deeply held beliefs are violated even more now that mifepristone is so widely available. What's happening now is people that aren't even medically trained are starting this procedure and dumping their complications on those of us who value the life of the of the mom and the life of her baby and it's it's medically ethically wrong and because of the relaxed regulations women in states where abortion is banned or limited can get access to mifepristone right now the abortion pill is available online and that ships all over the country and it ships from overseas and what's worse is that women are being told by the person who supplies the abortion drug to lie to the ER doc and not tell them. The doctor group pushed for an outright ban on mifepristone. As a Christian, I believe that, that every life is inherently valuable, no matter how small, uh, no matter if that life is not yet born. The court, however, agreed to only consider the issue of access, including whether women can skip the doctor visits and receive pills by mail. Holly still believes if the court rules in their favor, lives will be saved. 
So we always work with excellence um, as unto the Lord, but we can also count on him for the, the process and the results and, and we can lean on his strength and, and his wisdom and so trust that to him. And that, that really helps with a case like this um, that, that's going up before the Supreme Court and knowing ultimately um, that God is in control. A decision is expected in June. Lori Johnson, CBN News. Coming up, a special honor for some special soldiers known as the Ghost Army for their amazing but unknown service during World War II. We're going to bring you a look at the ceremony for the hidden heroism. We've got the story for you when we come back. You're watching CBN News Watch. Get your daily quick start from CBN News. A quick read on the important news of the day delivered right to your inbox. Stay current on breaking news, politics, and entertainment. Go to quickstart.news and subscribe today. An honor for the wartime service of American military units known as the Ghost Army. In a ceremony last week at the U.S. Capitol in Washington, these special soldiers received congressional gold medals in recognition of their unique and distinguished sacrifice. For decades, their mission during World War II was a secret, using innovative tactics to trick Nazis. House Speaker Mike Johnson highlighted their life-saving but hidden heroism. Because of the courageous work of this group, it is estimated that 15 to 30,000 lives were saved. Now, three of the seven known surviving members of the Ghost Army attended the ceremony. Congratulations to them. Time now for your Monday motivation. And today I want to leave you with this thought. As we begin this Holy Week together, there is no greater love than the love of our Heavenly Father. He sent his perfect son from heaven to die for an imperfect and often disobedient people. And then he looks on us, those people, and he doesn't see those flaws. With grace, he sees his perfect son. Well, that will do it for this edition of CBN News Watch. You can always find more of our news programs on the CBN News Channel. You can find them there at any time. You can also find them online. The address is cbnnews.com. Take a moment, let us know what you think about the stories you've seen here today. You can email us, newswatch at cbn.com. You can also reach out and touch us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We look forward to seeing you right back here same time tomorrow. Make it a marvelous Monday.